Hello, good evening everybody. Welcome to our first talk in the Farming the Future series. I'm Caroline Aitken and I'm the programme lead for the new BSc Regenerative Food and Farming at Schumacher College, uh, which opens in September. And it's the first undergraduate of its kind in the country uh, in that it offers a comprehensive professional qualification for working in regenerative food and farming. And it will really make the most of our unique context here at Dartington and all of the innovative food and farming enterprises here. And also drawing on an amazing range of partners across the region and across the country and across the world who are all working towards a transition to more regenerative and just food systems. So we're delighted to be partnering with Chelsea Green Publishing for this series of talks and we're going to be talking to a selection of their food and farming authors discussing their take on the future of food and farming and these talks will be taking place on the last Tuesday of every month so do look out for them on dartington.org so if you have any questions throughout the talk do post them in the Q&A section so if you put your mouse at the bottom of the screen you should see the Q&A chat box so pop your questions in there and we'll try to get to them as we go through the talk. So this month I'm going to be talking to Chris Smage, who is the author of A Small Farm Future. And he is a writer and an activist and a farmer. And he previously worked as a researcher in the social sciences and is now living and working on his farm in Somerset. Hi, Chris. Hi. Um, yeah, thanks for, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. Thanks for joining us. Um, so um, I really enjoyed the book. It was uh, there, there's a huge amount in there, and um, I could really your social sciences background was very evident in the kind of you know the depth and the breadth of what you covered in the book. But I found it very accessible, and um, it was a real joy to read. Right. Um, yeah. So so there's a lot to unpack, huge amount to talk about, and I'm sure that the listeners will have a lot of questions too. Um, but I just wanted to start by asking, what triggered your move from academia to farming? Well, I guess it kind of was uh, in the late 1990s, really, when, um, and I suppose that was a time when climate change was sort of beginning to be talked about as, um, you know, a, a kind of really serious issue and, and likewise um, sort of issues about energy and biodiversity were sort of rising up the agenda. and. And I guess I just kind of switched into that um, along with, with with my wife. We sort of, um, in fact, uh, you know, both of us knew Patrick Whitefield very well, who was quite influential on me back then in terms of sort of being introduced to permaculture and alternative farming. Um, so, yeah, I just sort of around about that time started thinking, yeah, you know, this is a really big deal and it's really going to sort of change the world that we, you know, it's going to upend the world that we're familiar with and it felt to me like food um, and food production was you know really it's at the heart of every community it's you know it's going to be very key in all of this so so the kind of pull factor was wanting to learn about that and get involved in it directly I mean to some extent there was a push factor of um, I mean I guess it's been popularised more recently by the the late great David Graeber in his book Bullshit Jobs, <laughs> where I think you know there's a lot of uh, a lot of modern jobs where we're all kind of stuck in offices, um, kind of um, you know sort of rising up career ladders or you know doing work that feels like in some sense it's a bit of a kind of arbitrary construction of of you know that we're you know running around in circles and 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 I guess at that time getting involved in something more practical in terms of you know producing a, a, a livelihood from the land you know it hasn't always been easy since but you know that that kind of set me on on that journey really you know those, those two things I guess. Yeah and I mean what you're describing Chris I think will be familiar to a lot of people there's a there seems to be a sort of common yearning doesn't there to get back to the land and and I think maybe we'll unpack that a little bit more later because it's not maybe always quite sort of living the dream that you know, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wonder then, because the book feels like it's the culmination of years worth of uh, thinking, researching, you know, practicing all of this stuff. Um, so for, for the benefit of people who haven't read the book yet, would you mind giving us a brief summary of, of what the book's about? Sure. Um, 
Uh, I mean, it, it's, it kind of falls into four parts. The first part I go through, um, uh, the main part of it is called 10 crises, where I go through a whole bunch of really sort of interlinked issues, um, uh, the sort of problems in the contemporary world that I think are going to push us into having to do, you know, having to face a very different future. I mean, I wish, you know, it's difficult writing a book about the future because obviously I'm, I'm bound to be wrong in all sorts of fundamental ways, but I kind of feel like, you know, we're at this sort of epochal chain moment of change now where we have to be thinking about the future and, and thinking about, you know, how we've got to change the way we're doing things. So that's kind of the first part of the book and some of the traps that we fall into in, in, in trying to think that through. The second part is a uh, Kind of looking at the ecology of small scale farming you know why um why might that have be able to offer some solutions and and you know i try and avoid suggesting that there are panaceas you know that uh, you can you can almost sort of like the alternative farming movement you know does risk replicating some of the sort of mainstream movement where it's like you know if we just if only we do this you know if only we sort of only grow perennial crops or don't till or you know whatever it is you know that's the answer and, and everything will be fine and and you know there's there's always trade-offs and difficulties and and you know there's always a social and political context to, you know as well as the sort of biological and ecological one so i go through some of those things um and then the third part is you know what would society look like or at least what sorts of issues do we have to address um in terms of um, access to land, uh, how we uh, interact as individuals, families, communities, um, you know, issues about the sort of geography of residence, town and country, uh, and so on, you know, a whole bunch of issues. I mean, obviously, I can only scratch the surface in. That's one thing, I, you know, when I started writing the book, I thought, great, I've got a whole book, I can write all about these things, but you quickly realise <laughs> that, uh, you know, uh, the issues are so huge you know and, and in the space of one book uh, there's you know there's not much you can uh, you know you can only really scratch the surface um, um and then the final part of the book is sort of the politics you know how is this going to play out you know how um you know how might we move towards a small farm future um so um and again you know difficult casting forward into the future especially when in some ways the I mean, I think there are a lot of lessons from the past and I try and draw on that, particularly in terms of drawing on the lessons of small scale, low impact, low energy societies of the past. But, you know, some of the lessons of the recent past, I think, may be not so applicable. Mm. And I mean, you say that you only got to scratch the surface and, and of course, you know, there are, as I said, a huge, there's a huge breadth of, of um, stuff that you cover, but, but it did feel as if you, you have the opportunity to look at things from quite a lot of different angles and really weigh things up. And one right. of the, there were a few concepts that I found really helpful in the book um, that I think it would be nice to talk about. Um, and one of them was the trade-offs which you've already mentioned um, and the sort of the resistance of the sort of, you know, uh, ideals essentially. Um, and really sort of avoid, yes, avoiding, avoiding oversimplicity solutions to what are very, very complex problems. And so when you were talking about the complex problems in the first section, the 10 crises that we face, you use the term wicked problems. And I thought that was really, really helpful in kind of understanding the reason that these problems are so complex. So I just wonder if you could sort of define a wicked problem. Uh, yeah, we, in fact, we, we discussed, shall I show a slide? I, I um, we discussed, um, before doing a few slides, I'll just try and share my screen. Um, so it's a bit of shameless self promotion there. And I had a few slides we were talking there that that's, um, in fact, uh, this is the, the farm that we've uh, developed over over the last 20 odd years. Um, I, I don't actually talk about the farm very much in the book, but we could talk about some aspects of that. But I'll just try and whiz through to my, there we go. Um, yeah, wicked problems. So these are the, these are the 10 uh, crises that I talk about in the first part of the book. And I suppose to illustrate um, what I mean by wicked problems, I mean, it's a term, that has a whole kind of academic literature in, in, in policy studies that um, um, that attaches to it that, um, you know, I mean, 
yeah, it sort of goes off into all sorts of interesting di directions. But I suppose, you, you know, and there's various different definitions and debates about it. But but I suppose, you know, what to me uh, is significant is that it, is that these problems. There's no kind of definitive formulation of the problem. You know, we can we can define a sort of um, some sorts of problems very sort of narrowly and technically you know like how do i how do i get a bigger uh, yield of um, of of cabbages from this field or, or or something like that or you know how do i make a light bulb that uses less energy but most of the sorts of problems we face now are much sort of bigger and more nebulous so if you look on the the, the sort of top left of of um uh, of the screen you know obviously climate change is a huge problem that you know that more or less everyone agrees now is is a problem that we face in in some shape or form but how do we deal with that you know some people will say uh you know it's it's a problem of uh fossil fuel use you know it's a technical problem of how we transition away from fossil fuels to cleaner forms of energy other people might say um well you know that's just a a, a superficial aspect you know really underlying that is the problem with the capitalist economy so you know moving to the top right you know the problem is capitalism other people might say well you know that in turn is just a surface manifestation of deeper issues about our culture or you know our spiritual connection with each other and with uh nature and i mean i happen to think all of those things are, are, are kind of true um, but it's almost like we don't sort of have a, a language to um, to home in on what the issue is, you know, where it's a wicked problem in the sense that we can't even define and, and agree what the problem is. And, you know, there's a whole other bunch of characteristics of um, wicked problems. I, I probably can't even remember them all now trying to <laughs> reel them off. But, you know, there are things like, you know, time is not on our side with a lot of these problems. You know, we, we could say, well, fine, you know, let's start off with energy and, you know, we could try a bit of nuclear power or a bit of PV, you know, if that doesn't work, we could uh, try a bit of a um, uh, bit more uh, economic equality or a bit of communism, you know, if that doesn't work, we could try and get a bit more spiritual, but, you know, obviously that's not, that's not how it works for numerous reasons, but one reason is that, you know, time is not on our side with issues like climate change and um, obviously a whole bunch of issues with you know water soil um that you know in relation to farming um um so yeah i mean that that in a sense is is the wicked problem and and it's a sort of weird situation because uh, you know i think that part part of my my little graphic here is that i think there are sort of clouds ahead you know <laughs> like trying to think through how we deal with these problems is is daunting and scary but, um, you know, as they say, every cloud has a silver lining. And I think, you know, we get into this whole duality of doom versus optimism. I like some of my online friends like to call themselves doomer optimists, which I, I, I quite like to sort of bring it together. But it's like, you know, already, you know, talking about the sort of economic problems we have, problems with the global uh, economic system, you know, there's so much suffering already. You know, some estimates suggest that about two billion people are physically undernourished, you know, there's so much poverty, so much inequality that, um, you know, even in its own terms, I don't think the, um, the, the way the world works now is, is sustainable, even if we leave aside these issues of climate change, energy, sort of water futures, soil futures. So, you know, so for all sorts of different reasons, we need to try and, um, uh, you know, get some fresh thinking, get some solutions. But it's not easy to do because you know we fundamentally it's difficult for us to agree and specify the problems i mean it's interesting that because you know when when you start to outline your the small farm future in your vision of that which would be good to get you to describe um just now but um you talk about how you know we sort of reach a little bit of a kind of impact because we're, we're faced with these very big and complex issues um, but we're seeking maybe perfect solutions and, and we're maybe not therefore accepting that, that any solution that we might choose will have inevitable trade-offs. And that was another thing that was, I found refreshing to read really, because often I think, you know, given the pressure of these issues, people feel the pressure to come up with, you know, ideal solutions that will, you know, completely solve everything. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, uh, that, that, that's right. And, I, you know, and you often get that with, uh, you know, when you uh, argue for political change, you sort of people are like, go on then, you know, suggest a better system, you know, give me a perfect, and, and you know, clearly you can't do that. And nobody ever sort of sat down with a pen and paper and, and sort of uh, planned the system that we presently have. So I think, you know, that it's a complex one because I think we do need utopianism. You know, we need, you know, this is absolutely what we need to be talking about in terms of wicked problems. We need to be, um, you know, discussing with each other and charting, um, uh, you, you know, a, a, a collective course out of the impasse that we're in. Um, but at the same time, I sort of think nothing is more utopian than, um, you know, than a sort of existing mainstream capitalist economics, this sort of notion that if we all uh, pursue our selfish ends and sort of make as much money as we possibly can and, and, and sort of capitalise the world as much as we possibly can, then, um, you know, then we're going to develop sort of market solutions that will sort out all these problems. I mean, that, that, that clearly isn't the case, you know, it clearly isn't working. So I think... Um, uh, you know, to try and sort of sit down and, and, and comprise, devise a sort of overall blueprint, um, you know, I think that's problematic thinking. It's part of the, you know, it's part of sort of um, part of the problem that we, you know, that, that we've sort of saddled ourselves with. But, you know, there are ways that, um, you know, people can do small things, local things. And, you know, again, there's a problem in that people are Kind of trapped institutionally i mean going back to your initial question about what drew me into farming i mean you know we were very lucky for a whole bunch of reasons to be able to um you know escape um from a, a sort of you know nine to five office job and get a little bit of land um you know that you know if we were in the same situation now we probably couldn't do that so you know access to land and the politics of access to land and you know the politics of well the politics of access to food ultimately are really critical um but nevertheless i think you know it, it doesn't have to be um uh you know a, a kind of single one-shot solution um you know we've got to sort of chip away at this in uh, you know in all sorts of different uh ways you know within our own context yeah and it's interesting though looking at these these separate little clouds on the screen and you realise that, you know, you can't really, as you said earlier, you can't really talk about any one of these things without inevitably ending up talking about all of the others. Right, and, yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. So it feels like part of the problem is that sort of the siloed thinking, the sort of inability to think holistically. Yeah. Um, and, and also, I guess, overwhelm, because these are global problems, they're huge problems. Yeah. And, um, and so... You know, it feels very overwhelming to think about how, how on earth can we possibly find global solutions for these huge issues. And yeah. so that sort of leads quite neatly into, into your vision for the small farm future, because in a way what that's about is finding local solutions uh, to global problems, which if, if every locality does that, then we start to see some serious impacts. So I wonder, if, would you mind sort of describing then what, what is the small farm future? Right. Well, it's difficult because, um, yeah, I mean, you know, one thing I was anxious to avoid in the book is, is, you know, is a kind of firm blueprint. You know, I don't, there isn't a kind of like, you know, you know, here it is, I've written it down, read my book and then go off and, and, you know, job done, just implement this. So, uh, it is very much about, um, yeah, you know, experimentation and, and, and charting, a different course but I mean I think broadly the sort of things that we're going to have to think about are uh, I th you know I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on cultivable land and um, you know that is not necessarily um, you know unless we get into some real sort of disaster worst case scenarios um, you know that's manageable but I think uh, we're going to be in what I call in the book tight farming situations where we're going to have a lot of people uh, needing to make land highly productive and they're going to be needing to do that in situations where less energy is available than you know certainly than we're accustomed to in wealthy countries like the like the UK so I think it's going to be quite labor intensive farming um, so small scale so back to you know um, issues of access to land um, I think it's going to be a situation where there's a lot of both local and global migration. Um, you know, people are going to be moving from 
uh, broadly speaking, from urban areas to more rural areas, um, from coastal areas or low-lying areas to inland or, or, or more elevated areas, and I think from lower latitudes to, to higher latitudes. Um, so there's going to be a lot of people on the move and, you know, potentially a lot of conflict around that. Um, so, you know, again, the part three of the book, I talk quite a lot about, you know, the sorts of ideas about communities and commons um, and, you know, the, the sort of whole politics um, around that. Um, but yeah, the, the, the sort of bottom line of it is, I think, um, you know, there's going to be um, a lot of people um, on small farms producing, you know, essentially producing food and fibre for local consumption, you know, so much of the existing global farm system is based on a small number of commodity crops, um, you know, which we grow because they're great crops in many ways, you know, wheat uh, is sort of the big one in the UK, which is a great crop um, in many ways, but, you know, part of the problem with it is a problem of scale, um, you know, that, um, that using cheap fossil energy um, uh, and the fact that it's that it's easy to get labour out of it, you know, we grow it on too big a scale that, you know, it's very sort of processable and tradable. Um, so um, whereas, you know, horticultural crops, um, uh, you know, are labour intensive, so a rich country like the UK where labour is is dear and energy is cheap, you know, we, we don't really um, produce the, you know, something like 80% of our fruit and 50% of the veg that we could be growing um, in the UK, um, you know, we import from elsewhere. So there's there's a lot of kind of scale dysfunctions at present that we know we're going to have to sort of unpick and reassemble. Um, so, you know, that it's quite a tall order, <laughs> but I think, um, you know, in some ways the, you know, the political and the economic pressures, I think, are going to are going to force us to, to, you know, to move in that direction. So, and you know, and the sooner we do that, and the sooner we, we kind of bite the bullet, the better. So, so in a way, what you're describing is maybe a kind of reverse of what happened in the Industrial Revolution, isn't it? When everybody sort of left the countryside and went to the cities, and you're talking about people moving back out into the countryside again. Um, so, so I can imagine, you know, that, that a lot of people might respond maybe not have the most positive response to that idea because we've become accustomed haven't we to the countryside being empty essentially yeah. so so i guess then the question is what what would it mean for the countryside what would it mean for nature if if we if that happened now i guess especially given our increased population yeah yeah, well, there's a lot of questions there. And I mean, yes, that, you know, some people sort of, you know, you quite often get the accusation that this is some sort of Maoist Khmer Rouge sort of, um, you know, back to the back to the land movement. But, you know, and that, you know, partly there's that. Well, there's two parts to your question. I think there's a sort of human politics side and also the, the sort of nature ecology side. So, you know, the human politics side is, I think, basically people go where they can, um, you know, have prosperity and have a good life. And over the last couple of hundred years, that has often been um, to the city. I mean, it's, it's more complex than that because it's not, you know, it's, it's not entirely true that um, there's, that, you know, urbanisation is a complex phenomenon and people, you know, poor people in poor countries tend to shuttle back and forth and often sort of maintain a footing on on rural land because you know creating a, a livelihood is difficult and people often have sort of mixed and multiple strategies and I think you know that's going to become more of a reality for all of us um, but um, you know I, part of it you know certainly in the UK I think part of it is a historical memory it's you know it's it you know it's not that people necessarily um, mind working hard or even you know going back to your initial question that you know I think a lot of people feel trapped in sort of urban so-called bullshit jobs you know but it, it's um but it's kind of hard to to, to 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 get out of them but you know part of the whole awkwardness about talking about um yeah labor intensification in farming I mean it's kind of a weird thing because we when we talk about most economic sectors and people are like great you're creating more jobs you know whereas in farming it's like you know, the, the, the narrative has always been about getting people out of farming. And I think that's partly to do with the whole the kind of historical memory of, um, 
social inequality ultimately being trapped in the countryside being you know either by sort of great economic capitalist forces or by sort of rapacious local landlords and aristocracies you know so so part of this has to be about reclaiming for ourselves as individuals and communities you know the the right and the ability to access land and, and to produce a livelihood for ourselves on the sort of ecological side um yeah i mean it's interesting there's a whole you know so-called land sparing versus land sharing debate that, that that goes on and you know there's arguments that it's best if we stay in cities and intensify um agricultural production on as small an area as possible so that we leave more for nature um uh, i mean in some situations i think that can be true there's there's probably parts of the world that we really ought to leave alone and and, and sort of let nature get get on with things but you know there's there's a whole bunch of um problems with that argument and and, and one of them i think is that sort of alienation and intensification you know cities are huge sort of gobblers up of energy and and resources and there's no intrinsic limit um uh, you know that 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 kind of um self um uh, self amplifying urban economy you know there's no real limit to it whereas you know one of the advantages of a household economy is that you produce for your needs you produce for the household and then you stop because um you know if 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 you want to intensify more it's you that has to do the work and it's and and you also are getting ecological feedback about um you know, the, the more that you intensify, um, the, the more uh, work and problems you, you sort of bring down on your head. So, you know, there is a case for for, for land sharing, um, um, you know, for being, you know, ultimately we are animals, you know, we're part of um, the, the ecological world. And I don't really see any solutions to, um, to, to, you know, these issues we've got up here. If we separate ourselves off and, and sort of regard the solution to these problems as, as, you know, somebody else's. I mean, I've got, um, should we, I could just quick, maybe quickly look at, uh, oh, there's, there's a, just as a sort of metaphorical illustration on our land, this is a, a whole bunch of grass snake eggs. Um, in the compost heap on our land and you know i mean i can't quantify it and, and obviously our land is just a sort of little pinprick but um uh, but in lots of ways uh, if you look at um this is a a, a drone shot of our land that um, we've as you can see we've sort of diversified it over the last 20 years or so away from the more singular uses that you can see um uh, in in the fields surrounding it and I mean, I, I don't talk about our farm all that much in the book for a whole bunch of reasons, and I don't particularly present what we do as a sort of exemplar that, you know, where we've sort of got all the right answers. But what you can see here is a mix of woodland and grassland and more intensive cropland and also, you know, human residence and, you know, much more intensive human interaction on the land. But you can see it's kind of mixed uh, levels of intensity and more sort of extensive stuff going on and you know we've certainly found it noticeable that you know there's a real sort of amplification of different niches um, on our site that has sort of gradually brought more and more wildlife and more and more sort of habitat um, in, into play over the years so whether we are doing this you know as I say I'm not necessarily saying that everyone should sort of develop their farms exactly like this as, as we've done but I think you know at the at the local level at the community level we need to think about you know our need for for for, for woodland our need for um you know, grass habitats and and you know more intensive cropping that we need to sort of keep to a limit and um yeah you know i think it is um eminently compatible with wildlife you know to what to what level you know, obviously there's a whole all sorts of complexities underlying that and debates mm -hmm. about you know what um you know what what we can save what we can live with um but I, you know i don't see it as fundamentally problematic in fact you know i think the problem is more if we if we kind of isolate ourselves away in in cities and and sort of um try and uh invoke a sort of notion of pristine wilderness i think is you know becomes more problematic well, well yeah and also it's a little bit i mean in in the uk we, we don't you know you could argue that we don't really have any pristine wilderness left now i think it's over 70 percent of the uk's land area is farmed 
and yeah. the way that we're farming now is, you know, doesn't leave any room for nature. And I think probably one of the things people would find most striking about the image of your farm um, is the diversity in there. And yeah. as you say, you know, you, you're creating lots of ecological niches there, but yeah. also scale is really key here, isn't it? In no, sorry, I missed so scale is really key yeah, yeah. in terms yeah. of the ecology, but also um, from the human perspective as well. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And I mean, just to go back to that notion of pristine wilderness, you know, there's a, kind of a lot of interesting work now on um, the sort of history of indigenous cultures globally, where, you know, what what incoming European colonists kind of thought of as being pristine wilderness was actually landscapes that were you know, seriously managed using, um, um, you know, uh, fire, uh, water management, um, and, and wildlife management in, in all sorts of ways. And, and you know, that's, that's partly why I don't really want to, um, yeah, don't, don't make a big deal about sort of what we're doing on our farm, partly because I think, again, it's part of the modern malaise is that we have this whole notion that we've got to be innovative and do things that are really different and new. And actually, most parts of the world, um, you know, historically developed, um, really successful, sustainable agricultures. I mean, not, you know, not always, it's not, you know, there's always sort of um, uh, issues of, you know, always ecological issues and, and, and sort of um, drawdown of resources here and there, but essentially people have figured out low impact, low energy, labor intensive, usually mixed agricultures you know kind of with something akin to what you see on the screen here with a mixture of grassland you know trees grass and and um, and then more intensive crops uh, and also obviously with a sort of permaculture hat on tree crops you know fruit and nut crops um, as well uh, you know people have figured out these systems long term in the past and you know i'm not saying there's there's no um, scope for innovation and trying new things but that, I don't think that's fundamentally the problem you know that, that we face that you know the problem that we face is sort of you know getting out of some of the the, the sort of political and economic squeezes that we've that we've put ourselves in in, in more recent times so you know in, embracing uh, in, embracing the um, traditional local um, history of human nature interactions I think is a good place at least to start as we think about um, moving into the future. Yeah absolutely and I know I know Chris that you're not you're not holding up your farm as an exemplar you know you, you've been clear about that and and you know any of us who manage land know that it's always um, you know work in progress and experimental and you know receiving feedback <laughs> But I wonder if you could, because um, I know you've got some nice pictures, whether you could just kind of show us a few pictures of some of the sort of systems you've got in place. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, what have we got here? So the main, this was a photo of part of our market garden. So the main thing that we, uh, the main sort of food uh, or commercial food production thing we do on the site is a little um, um, local veg box scheme little market garden with a couple of acres so um that was a shot in its sort of wintry guise or part of the market garden um that uh, chris who works in the market garden um took uh, a, a couple of months back um yeah so that's the main thing we do and, and you know just another shot um of um just to make the point it's quite labor intensive you know it's sort of um horticulture um uh, which i you know i do think horticulture ultimately is is um is, is is kind of at the root of what we need to be doing but it requires work and i you know part of what i try and do is get out of this sort of um a uh, very dichotomous sort of farmer versus non-farmer mindset yeah you know what a planning officer here in Mendit many years ago told me that I wasn't a proper farmer, which I've sort of worn as a badge of honour ever since, you know, but I think whatever we do, you know, even if it's just growing uh, some herbs on a windowsill in a, in a flat, you know, call yourself a farmer, you know, we all have to take responsibility however we can for producing a bit of food. But anyway, yeah, you know, um, a small market garden is our main thing. Um, and then, um, uh, I mentioned um, trees and grassland earlier, so sort of thinking um, about integrating them and, and um, you know, uh, obviously there's a whole debate about meat and livestock that, um, you know, is, is uh, 
burns fiercely in um, in agricultural circles, but you know, thinking about um, how to integrate um, those aspects of it, uh, and also the social aspect. This is a, a, a co-op called Shared Earth Learning that um, uh, is based on our land, and they do a lot of work with. Um, kids um, and uh, people with social needs of one kind and another and, and sort of refugees as well. So there's, um, you know, so part of it is about bringing people onto the land and, and sort of having that, that kind of human interaction as well. So uh, have I got any more pictures? Oh, we've already seen the snake eggs, haven't we? And uh, yeah, and, um, you know, as I say, I, I, um, a lot of it, what we've done over the years has been experimenting with things on a small scale, um, you know, big debate, you know, should, should we, should we be having sheep or, you know, should we, should we instead be having trees in, in, in the uplands and, you know, so I quite like the old idea of wood pasture, so experimenting with, uh, hey, you know, maybe we can have uh, trees and sheep, you know, it requires quite intensive management so you know a whole bunch of issues there but um you know again wood pasture was an interesting issue because it was ordinary people who didn't have all that much access to land i mean i mean you know all about this caroline as a permaculturist you know stacking functions you know trying to get as many different uses out of a small bit of land as possible so you know things like that and uh Oh yeah, that was a slide just to prove it doesn't always, all our plans don't always work. And um, <laughs> sometimes things go a bit horribly wrong and particularly with climate change, um, you know, uh, I don't want to suggest that we've necessarily, uh, you know, everything doesn't always um, work perfectly on the farm. So um, yeah, um, water management and, you know, water, big issue globally, too much of it or too little of it, you know, um, we, we're going to have to deal with. So um, yeah. So yeah, a few things, a uh, few illustrations there. Yeah, lovely. Thanks, Chris. And, and I mean, it, it's interesting, isn't it? Because while, you know, because what, what we're looking at here is we're looking at um, diverse mixed farming on quite a small, quite a human scale, which really enables uh, all of those kind of interactions, you know, where you can have, you can have your sheep and, you know, under your trees and you can uh, use your pigs to help you cultivate and you can use waste products to feed to the animals. And so that that is something that while while we are seeing a decline in large specialised farms, quite an alarming decline um, in farms in the UK in recent years, we are seeing a small but steady increase in small mixed farms. And, and it's yeah. interesting how those farms have actually been able to weather a lot of the kind of, particularly the economic storms as well as the, the literal storms. Um, because they because they've not generally if they're very small they've not been eligible for subsidies and so they've had to find innovative routes to market and that's actually given them more long-term resilience um, and so could it be then that if we if we kind of if we support these small mixed farms which are generally generally selling directly to their communities through veg box schemes and food hubs and farmers and markets um, you know, could we could we grow that movement, and could that be a way to um, to make the small farm future happen? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, as I said earlier, I think we need to experiment in, in in all sorts of different ways. But I think you know, generally, decommodification. I think is um, we need we need to do that. So you know, one aspect of that, I think, as I was just saying, is to break down the sort of amateur professional distinction and for people to you know grow grow their own food um but also commercial growers um you know generally as a small grower um you yeah you you, you don't you know you you can't really get on the sort of grants and um subsidy um system and you can't really sell wholesale so you have to you know you have to sort of sell direct to the customer so build a relationship with supportive um, local uh, customers, but it does sort of buy you out of that, um, you know, the way that the, the, the sort of normal capitalist economy, you know, just squeezes, um, you know, you, you know, the whole logic of it is to, is to sort of, it, it's kind of a race to the bottom, you know, it's it kind of to, to, to make the margins as wafer thin as possible at, at the cost of, you know, like I was saying earlier, you know, that basically, you know we're importing most of our horticultural um goods because um you know the 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 labor economics of it 
aren't promising in 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 the contemporary UK. But I think you know that is um, that's going to change. Um, and uh, and to some extent, um, you know, it's sort of relatively easy for us. You know, on our site, we're growing a lot of our own food. You know, so if um, you know if if there are sort of market problems, I mean, we had that with COVID when all of a sudden, you know, we normally get sort of one or two new customer requests a week and all of a sudden when the supermarket shelves went empty um you know we had like a couple of hundred requests but obviously we were still producing our own food and you know we did what we could to to increase production but you know there are these real pinch points i mean you know we've seen it this recently with the the boat in the suez canal or you know the 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 blizzard in texas you know there are these real um you know real threats to the way that you know we have these very non-resilient um sort of global systems and we need to sort of um you know we we, we need to relocalize them and I, I do think labor is really key to that i mean it's kind of interesting because in you know in a lot of rice i've just read a fan, really interesting book the rice economies which has all you know rice farming has always been much more labor intensive and we've sort of got away from that for all sorts of reasons in um you know in in in, in the west and in, in in sort of wheat based and the original capitalist countries but labor is fantastically productive of food and of potentially of well-being if we get it right and so that you know absolutely is i think what we need to focus on and i think you know we can all play a part in that at whatever level you know whether we produce food or not kind of taking an interest in food in our local communities is got to be really key. Brilliant, thanks, Chris. And, and I can see that there's quite a few questions now popping up. So, um, so I'd like to give a bit of time to, to look at those. Um, Will I? I'll, I'll stop. So, uh, uh, right. So, um, from our back of, we have a question. So. Paul Kingsnorth, um, a recovering environmentalist, I like that as a description, uh, seems to think it's all too late and has taken himself off to Ireland to plough his own furrow. <laughs> wonder if Chris has a view on that. Are you, are you aware of Paul Kingsnorth? Uh, yeah, yeah, I've interacted with him. I've, I've written a little bit for Dark Mountain. Um, I mean, I think... <sighs> Yeah, I suppose it, it's it's kind of complex. You know, he's written one or two things that a lot of people have sort of jumped on, and you know, for um, being a little bit too sort of shutting the doors, a bit too localist, and a bit too um, doomy. I mean, I think, um, uh, and you know, I, it would be easy to sort of jump on and critique as well. But I, I you know, I think. Um, he's kind of an interesting original thinker and he's sort of inviting us to really uh, you know to, to sort of put the most positive spin I can on it he's inviting us to really inhabit what it means to be um uh, to, to to create a local livelihood and he's kind of and, and in a sense it's kind of a similar you know message to what we were talking about earlier it's easy you know to look at all these issues climate change and um um you know water issues energy issues and and just to sort of throw up your hands in despair or or sort of hope that the government is going to somehow solve it for us and i think you know i think he's right that they won't and you know the only thing we can do is um uh you know is move forwards ourselves um you know either as individuals or within communities so and 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 not to necessarily you know these these sort of uh big highly capitalized solutions you know to stop looking at everything as a resource or as a you know like how can we create a market uh, around this that's gonna that's gonna create a solution so i kind of mm. yeah i i think paul is worth reading and i've certainly learned a lot from him i don't agree with everything he says but you know i think uh this the the, the this you know his kind of deep engagement with the need to um be in place think at some level I think is is something that you know that we can learn from. Mm. I mean it comes down to diversity again I think doesn't it I, I think you know to to um to explore different viewpoints is it, you know is always valuable in some way even if you don't right, right. You know, there's always something to take away from it. Okay I've got another question um this one says hi Chris if we assume policies 
policy change doesn't happen in a way that really unlocks the future you're describing, what do you see as the key points of maximum leverage in the system that will help us move most quickly towards that small farm future? So, I mean, you have you have addressed that a little bit. Is there anything else that you think? Um, I mean, yeah, there's, I mean, there's all sorts of ways that, um, you know, you can try and leave a, um, uh, you know, existing policy, and, and I really admire people that that do that and sort of, you know, I mean, you know, we had the whole farm bill going through, and you know, um, like the Land Workers Alliance trying to get agroecology into it, and you know, it it all seems a terribly thankless task to uh, to me, but you know, there are, you know, there, I think that game is, you know, is is worth playing. But I mean, I suppose what I argue in my book, um, you know, I I do think we are going to face difficult dark times where there you know there is um a great danger of people sort of closing the the, the borders and putting up barriers and you know we're seeing that already and, and you know, as, I, as i was saying earlier i think there is going to be um a lot of people on the move um and um you, you know it's so easy to then to sort of put up the barriers you know which is happening globally and i think you know for quite apart from ethical considerations, I, you know, ultimately, I don't think that's going to work. And, you know, I think the it's kind of key, key sort of permaculture thing, maybe the problem is the solution, you know, there is going to be a big resorting of population, that's going to put pressure on land. So we need to, you know, we need to embrace the change and the labour um, that that involves and the need to sort of rethink what it means um, to be local. But um, yeah, but I talk in the book about what I call the supersedure state, and, and I, I mean I won't go into the details. But I think you know we've we've seen we've had very many episodes of this in global history, and you know this one I think is probably going to be the, the the biggest and the and and the the trickiest. But um, you know essentially the core centralized state decays; it can no longer sort of exert. You know it, it kind of is 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 drawing a lot from people, but it's giving out some welfare and services to people. And increasingly, I mean, we kind of saw that in Texas. It was like, you know, the water went out, the power went out, and a lot of local politicians kind of said, oh, what do you expect me to do? You know, it's not our problem. And, and I do sort of believe, you know, Rebecca Solmit uh, has this book, um, A Paradise Made in Hell. I, you know, I do think that's kind of what's going to happen, that the centralised state in some of its areas is going to be less able to deliver the welfare that people are expected to, uh, you yeah, know, that people expect to receive. That means people are going to be thrown back on their own resources. And I do believe that people have great skills in self-organizing and working with each other when they have to, um, to create um, positive outcomes. I mean, you know, it's not all a bed of roses, I know, but that I think is what we've got to work on. We've got to assume there are going to be these crises, these kind of um, pinch points in, in um, existing politics. And, you know, we have to sort of build and work with uh, whoever's in place. And I, I talk about that quite a bit in the last part of the book. Um, and, you know, in some ways it's a sort of weak answer. Um, yeah, but I think one of the problems, you know, going back to the wicked problems, you know, there isn't, there aren't going to be market solutions. There aren't going to be simple political um, solutions like sort of um, uh, you know, sort of working class activism in and of itself isn't going to deliver, um, you know, a, a, a complete solution. It's going to be much more chaotic, I think, and involve much more, it's going to have to involve a much more varied, um, um, yeah, you know, populist reconfiguration of, 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 of people around land. So, you know, that's basically what I talk about in the book uh, without having any simple solutions. And, and I have to say that the way the way that you laid that out in the book was so um, was so practical and sort of non-alarmist. <laughs> and um, and you know there is a lot of detail, and it's worth pointing that, that out. You know these are huge topics, but there's a lot of detail, and you've really you've really kind of um, played out different scenarios um, as as possible outcomes and described them in in a very sort of um, matter of fact and kind of realistic way, which I found strangely reassuring given the oh, time. Great. Thank you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> given given actually the sort of you know the alarming nature of it. Um, but again I think it was just it just felt very balanced to me um, rather than um, 
yeah, maybe sort of in any way sort of uh, sensational, you know, about that. Um, and of course, we can all envisage all sorts of different um, future scenarios, um, uh, which yeah. can be rather anxiety provoking at, at the moment. Um, okay, so there's another question here um, from Guyan. Um, Chris, is your hope that more of the UK population are easily going to relate to the land and farming and rural wildlife realistic when needs must? Our new millennials with their cyber screen identities might find this earth transition rather difficult, possibly even impossible. Well, that's an interesting question. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I, I guess I would slightly disagree with the premise that young people are, are um, you know, are, are not signed up to this, um, partly because um, I think, you know, there's more of the bullshit job phenomenon, you know, when I was um, sort of in my early 20s, it was possible to sort of, you know, get some sort of training and then have a career and sort of see yourself, you know, rising up the ladder and mm -hmm. earning lots of money and having a big house and all the rest of it, whereas now, you know, that in many ways has been taken away from young people. And so I think people are, you know, they're much more um, clued in than certainly my generation has been to you know, partly to some of the issues that are facing us, but also to the uh, the fact that the sort of mainstream job economy is, you know, is is isn't necessarily that attractive. So certainly over the 20 odd years I've been involved in the alternative farming movement, there's more and more young, you know, active, thoughtful young people getting involved in it. Um, I mean, I, I, I do accept that it can be a bit of a shock to the system, you know, it certainly was a <laughs> bit of a shock to, to 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 me sort of um you know starting to be a market grower and and, and the sort of the amount of work relative to reward and and, and all the rest of it so yeah you know that there are you know there are serious issues of labor and capital uh, underlying all of this but um but yeah i, I think you know there's that the, the sort of ideal scenario or you know I, I suppose i like to think in terms of least worst case scenario is you know be realistic but accentuate the positive there's a lot of young people with an interest in these issues a consciousness of climate change and energy futures and, and so on um, much more interest in small scale farming um, and um, yeah so I think um, yeah that, that I, I, it's that isn't really the problem so much as the institutional structures and you know, access to land for young people. I mean, I talk about that quite a bit in the book, the way that land values inflate beyond the ability of most ordinary people to be able to afford to buy land or housing. You know, I think that's probably the, the key set of issues that we need to focus on perhaps more than, um, you know, the enthusiasm for it, which I think is there and certainly will be there when people start confronting, you know, food shortages in communities or, you know, disruptions to global supply lines and so on. Yeah, yeah. and uh, thank you, because that's actually just answered another question, which was about what you meant by access to land. So you've just answered that really nicely. And I mean, as far as young people go, you know, they they are the sort of cyber screen generation, but they're also the outdoor learning and forest schools generation. Yeah. Um, even, even in urban environments, the schools are really focused on getting kids outside as well as making them aware of, of um, you know, ecological issues. So, yeah, you know. and that's really important. You know, I mentioned shared earth learning on our site earlier. Uh, I mean, that's really important. Um, in, you know, there's they some of the kids they have are kids who are sort of in trouble at school and, and um, you know, but mostly they're kids who basically can't hack being in a classroom all day and they're, you know, the quote unquote naughty kids, but they come here and you just see them sort of interacting uh, with you know with the the world with with new eyes I mean I don't want to idealize it too much but do, do you know what I mean that people suddenly find you know like building a fire and you know sort of playing with the uh, sticks and looking at animal you know animals and wildlife and so on it's a whole new sort of vista for many of them and I think you know it sometimes farming and agriculture has been dismissed as you know like, like no one you know no one wants to do that that you know that's that's what you do if there is if you haven't got anything better to do but you know hopefully that's changing and and you know other organ you know, i'm involved in an organization called the ecological land co-op that's trying to make land um you know small holdings uh more affordable um for people and you know 
the extent to which you can do that within existing economic structures is is difficult but you know there are sort of initiatives around and you know we need to need to build on those yeah it might be worth mentioning as well the um the one planet development um law. right yeah well wales is you know yeah i mean why uh, as yeah sadly why well good for them but you know wales and scotland are well ahead of england i think in Mm. They're thinking about um, land issues and sort of community access to land and, and um, yeah, one planet development in Wales sort of geared to people to some extent, um, you know, the possibility of having a self-reliant small holding, you know, is, is somewhere I think we need to move um, here in the UK. Yeah. Sorry, in think, England. Sorry. Yeah, I think things might be slowly moving in that direction, hopefully. Um, OK, so another question um possibly the final question we'll see how we do um isn't redistribution of land central to this so we've touched on this a bit but caroline says 70 percent of land it's roughly 70 percent don't quote me on that <laughs> is farmland does that include grouse moors 550,000 acres of england doesn't include scotland ireland or wales is used for grouse I mean, that's quite a specific issue, but it, it kind of speaks to bigger, you know, broader issues, I feel. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd, I'd recommend looking at Guy Shrubsoll's uh, book, Who Owns England, um, which is sort of very interesting on this. I, yeah, it is 70% of UK land is agricultural. Uh, that includes rough grazing. I mean, a lot of that is grassland. Um, don't know if it includes grouse moors. Um, but yeah, there's real, um, you know, in, in Britain, more than in some countries, but in, in most countries, there are real inequities in land ownership, which Guy talks about very interestingly in his book. So yeah, that is absolutely a, a, a key thing um, that needs addressing. I mean, I suppose what I would say is that, um, you know, we have intensified, you know, I talked about those commodity crops earlier, we've intensified uh, the production of, of a small number of crops, you know, wheat, um, you know, wheat and beef basically are, um, and, you know, a few other cereal crops and oilseed, right, you know, but that, you know, farmers have been sort of pushed into that through all sorts of historical reasons, um, and obviously have a lot of cheap fossil energy at their disposal. So, um, you know, it's possible to have one or two people farming hundreds of acres um, that won't that, that isn't going to be the case in the future, and so that potentially opens up a lot of land um, to you know much more widely for people to access if we get the politics and the economics of it right. You know, so that's that's the the the, the key thing I think. And um, I mean, there was another question about about applying your your ideas to. Um, an American context to the, to the US and whether you thought about that and, and I mean I think we well, just talked about beef and wheat <laughs> you know which, and with the states I, I would imagine there is similar infrastructure to overcome just on a bigger scale. Yeah I mean um, yeah there's a really interesting book by Joan Thursk uh, called Alternative Agriculture a history of it where she talks about the, you know beef and wheat having been the the, the sort of um, go to basis of English agriculture through history, but times in history when that doesn't work. So people turn to other things. Um, you know, the US, uh, yeah, I do, I do talk about US, um, the US situation quite a bit in the book, and I've written about it here and there, like an article in the Land magazine. I mean, there's a whole kind of colonial situation in the US that is a little bit different, but in some ways that, you know, the situation in the UK is similar in that, you know, when we were talking about urbanization earlier, that was partly, you know, as a result of Britain's colonies sort of drawing in food from elsewhere, or, you know, the, the whole sort of free market in food um, narrative often comes from rich, powerful countries that, to, whose interests it suits to sort of buy food in. And I think we're still in that mindset in the UK, I mean, the US is a bit different because it's such a huge country that's a big agricultural exporter. But there, you know, aridity, like climate change is a huge issue. You know, I mean, I, I do have some um, tables and figures in the book where globally, partly as a result of the Green Revolution, we've got more and more reliant on a small number of breadbasket areas in the world, you know, one of which is the North American prairies. And, you know, uh, Good, good old fashioned agricultural saying we shouldn't put all our eggs in one basket, you know, because um, 
more and more those areas are threatened by various you know political and economic issues but also ecological issues climate change aridity so you know so the argument about being more self-reliant isn't a kind of you know sort of screw everyone else argument it's actually it's actually a more um convivial argument that you know if you take care of your own food shed it allows other people to take care of theirs um but certainly we need to address you know huge issues of global food trade and global food power and we you know we in a sort of brexit context in the uk we still haven't really got out of that mindset um you know in terms of being a rich country that can afford to buy food from wherever and you know against the popular stereotype we can produce all the food we need in the uk uh, but it does require more people to be um, to be working in in agriculture. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good point to wrap up on, actually, because I think I think for a lot of people, they have this idea of the UK being a very small place with a very big population, which it is. But actually, when you're talking about biointensive agriculture, you know, we can we can feed a lot of a lot of. Yeah, land. yeah. I mean, I should, I do some sort of number crunching in the book where I think to my satisfaction I think I show that you know the land area is not currently a problem it's it's the you know it's the organization of agriculture that's the problem yeah brilliant thanks so much Chris it's been really great to talk to you and um and again I really enjoyed the book and um yeah would really recommend that others uh, uh read it too yeah great thanks uh, yeah it's a pleasure talking to you so yeah thanks very much Thanks, Chris. Um, so, um, as I said at the beginning, this is one in a series of, um, of talks, and those will be happening on the last Tuesday of every month. Um, so we've got um, three more planned. Um, the next one in April, at the end of April, will be with Matt Rees Warren, who's the ecological gardener. And then in May, we'll be speaking to Nancy and John Hayden uh, about their book, Farming on the Wild Side. And then in June, we'll be talking to Nicolette Han Niman, uh, Defending Beef. She's a vegetarian lawyer turned beef rancher. So that'll be interesting. Um, so um, tonight's talk is free, um, but if you're able to donate, we'd be very grateful. And that money will go towards supporting uh, the Schumacher College Learning Programme and the authors um, who come and talk to us in this series. Um, and there'll be a link in the live chat to uh, where you can donate. Um, if you'd like more information about BSC and regenerative food and farming, you can find out more at schumachercollege.org.uk. And you'll also find links there to live chats where you can come and talk to us and ask questions about, about the programme specifically. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you again to Chelsea Green for co-hosting this series. And thanks again to Chris Mage for this evening. Thanks, everybody.